Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation. My name is Dorian Guzman. I'm working currently for a small startup uh, called Smart Helio. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the case use of uh, genetic algorithms to do uh, PV power simulation and digital twinning. Uh, so first, uh, I would like to talk about uh, Smart Helio itself. Um, what we do right there is basically if you have um, SCADA systems or you have databases for PV plants, we're able to connect via API to those ones and then do um, real-time analytics. Real-time uh, obviously can be defined in different ways depending on the frequency of uh, sampling from the SCADA systems or also uh, perhaps that the client just one every day data analytics, right? Uh, so basically what we do is forecasting uh, due diligence uh, with the predictive analytics. And also we identify underperformances and obviously we, we give the causes of those underperformances. Uh, we, we deal with data as well. And we have a hardware to, to get some analytics from panel levels. All right, enough of marketing. Uh, let's go to the case study. Uh, First, I would like to set a common ground here. Uh, I will assume that not all of you come from photovoltaics. Uh, so therefore, I'm going to talk about the status quo of photovoltaic simulation. Uh, so basically, what we have in photovoltaic simulation is well, the, all, the <coughs> all the characteristics for the PV panels comes from the design, right? So we take all the characteristics from the design, and then we put that design in any software for simulation, right? So basically what we are doing is creating a digital twin of the actual PV plan, right? So this digital twin then can be mixed with weather conditions, let's say uh, irradiance and temperature from the past, and then obviously can be simulated and compared with the measurements, we're gonna have obviously some uh, reasons for underperformance and we can also call it uh, corrected maintenance, right? But what happened when we have forecasting for uh, weather conditions? Well, similar thing, we can also do a simulation for forecasting, and then uh, we do some predictive and correct and preventing maintenance. Obviously, this becomes a bit more complex with time because the initial parameters we have here when we are simulating in the future are not going to be the, the same ones, right? So we have degradation, we have soiling effects, so we have the performances. Uh, cracks on the panels, whatever. So obviously this uh, characteristic has to be uh, updated time to time, right? But then what happened uh, when we don't have these characteristics? So this is a real question. Uh, so we start from backwards. So we have the past data for weather, right? And we have the measurements. And then we need something uh, to create basically a digital twin, and then from di this digital twin, we, we're gonna extract the characteristics and then use the same software that we had to create simulations, right? So in this case, uh, this thing that we needed, uh, we choose genetic algorithms. I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with this. If not, I'm gonna try to, to explain it super briefly. Uh, this is was introduced first I think in the 70s, so we can assume that is there for some time already. Uh, it is inspiring the evolution itself. So it comes with uh, some steps. So first you have the population, right? So you have the initial population, and then you have uh, fitness scoring. Fitness scoring can be any metric you, you wanna set to that population. So if we talk about the, the um, evolution, so the one that aged the most, then that's, that could be one, one metric, right? So then we have uh, fitness selection. Some characteristics of the members of one population can go to the next generation, right? So we have some characteristics and some of us are gonna, ha are gonna pass those characteristics to the next generation. And then comes the crossover. Crossover is basically when you have uh, two members of the population and then you just mix uh, the characteristics of those members to create one new member of the next population. And then uh, you have mutation. Mutation is basically uh, you take one of the members of the population and then you change with a percentage of mutation. 
some of the characteristics of that member, right? These last two, crossover and mutation, help a lot when you have a problem that, is, that has many local minima, right? So we are focusing global minima, and these, these, two, these two steps help a lot to, to jump these local minima and go to the, to the global minima. And then basically, uh, well, you just meet the criteria and the process is over. How can we uh, pass this to the PV world? Okay, for this small example, we define uh, six PV system parameters, um, a bit lower than the parameters we had in the scenario before, in the presentation before. Uh, so in this case, we just have six parameters. So we know that with these six parameters, we can actually simulate uh, relatively accurate one PV system, right? Uh, I'm gonna try to explain fast what the, the parameters are. Basically, nominal power is the installed capacity, how big the plant is. Uh, tilt angle is just the inclination of the plants uh, towards the sun, the normal of the sun. And then you have azimut angle, is just the orientation of the plant. Albedo effect on the radiance is basically what you have in the surroundings. If uh, basically the radiance is, has two components, one is direct, one is diffuse. So if you have um, high albedo, that means that the diffuse irradiance that is gonna get reflected more and gonna obviously is gonna get absorbed by the panels, right? And then you have uh, the temperature coefficient, which is basically, that tells you uh, how the, the panels behave in outdoor conditions at different temperatures. And obviously, this EAC ratio. This is just like how, how much energy we can get from the actual energy produced, right? <coughs> okay. So let's start with the uh, initialization step. Initialization step is just basically create a population. That means that we uh, create many systems, many PV systems, uh, using different uh, parameters for those systems, right? So we have, let's assume that all, all these uh, systems that we have here have different characteristics and different parameters as well. Uh, once we create the, the population, so we go to the fitness scoring. In this case, the fitness scoring is basically we simulate each of the systems that we created before and we compare with the measurements in the past, right? And then those measurements, um, we just basically set a score. For in this case, we, we define that mean absolute deviation would be enough to define a score for the systems that we have here. Um, so at the, end, at the end, what we have is all the population uh, with a certain score for each member of the population, right? If it's not really clear, you can uh, tell me. <laughs> I hope it's clear. Uh, basically, in the second part, fit selection, we are starting creating our second generation of uh, the systems, right? So uh, for this thing, obviously, as I mentioned before, uh, everything is, is inspired by the evolution. So that means that higher uh, score plans have more probability to go to the next generation, right? In this case, um, we assume that we're gonna take 85% of the next population based on the probability of getting peak from, the, from this, the current generation, right? Then we go to the crossover part. The crossover part, as I mentioned before, is just basically a mix of characteristics of two plants, and then we create a new plant for the next generation. Uh, in this case, we define that 10% was enough uh, for the crossover part. And the last part is the mutation. The mutation, uh, could happen only to the, those best um, elements of the, the previous population. We define it like that. You can also define that is, it could happen to any member of the population and it, it just goes to the next generation. So basically, you just select that random, the best, one of the best members of the population, and then you apply a, a mutation percentage for each of the characteristics. In this case, the characteristics are obviously the six parameters that, that we consider at the beginning, right? Uh, so in this case, we set a mutation uh, that can build just 5% of the, of the new population, right? So we repeat this until obviously we met the criteria, right? What the criteria were? Uh, first, we were monitoring two main things. One of them was the best, mem best member of the whole population. So we were, change we were creating new populations and new populations, and then we were just monitoring the best member of uh, the population, but also we were monitoring 
the average of the whole population, right? So, uh, because what could happen is you are, if you are trapped in a local minima, you will have always the best member improving, but then uh, your whole population is not going to improve or it's going to go backwards or whatever. So that's why we choose to, to, to select this, these two metrics. So basically when we see that uh, they are not improving anymore after certain uh, evolutions, so we said that that's, that's our best uh, um, yeah, optimization. Uh, so basically what we have at the end, it is like we select the best member, and obviously this member has already the six parameters. So we take these six parameters and we create a digital twin of the actual system, right? So we know the characteristics of the actual system right now because we are measuring that system. It's not because it comes from the, from the design. Uh, a lot of times what happens in PV world is that you have one design and then when you install, there is an effect called PID. Um, so this effect is super strong at the beginning of the, of the installation. So it's basically it's not going to work installation is not going to work as you expect. So in this case, we're able to, to extract the parameters in the real world, how they are measuring, uh, how they are being measured. Uh, yeah, and basically we use later this for simulation and forecasting. Uh, which is interesting here to, to notice is, uh, for example, if we consider nominal power, right? And we are doing this, this same um, optimization, let's say every five minutes, we have the sample of the PV measurements every five minutes, so we can actually create these six parameters every six minutes, every five minutes, right? So we have, let's, let's consider just nominal power. We can actually create a data a time series of, of uh, nominal power, right? In that case, we can actually see if the system is degradating or if we have soiling in the system or if there's snow in the system, for example, or something like that. So with, with selecting the, the right parameters for your digital twin, you can actually see what is happening with your digital twin. If you uh, actually, if you get, for example, current and you are able to digital twin your current, you can see degradation there. Or you get voltage and you can twin your, your voltage, then you can see, for example, uh, shading uh, patterns over there. So yeah, it depends uh, what you are looking for, but this is yeah, basically the, the overall um, optimization. If you need additional information, uh, you can refer to this publication. And yeah, thank you. I'm open for questions. Cool, thanks a lot for this very interesting talk in particular, I mean, in this very difficult spot, so thanks a lot. So I'm sure there are questions, yes. Thanks for the talk. You talked about the parameters, but you didn't talk much about the model. Is it like equation-based, physics-based, or are you also using yeah. data? Good question. Uh, the model actually, uh, we use physics-based model. There are a bunch of them out there. So uh, at, the, at the end of the thing, uh, you're going to have usually a deviation that comes from the model. Uh, but that deviation is already assumed on the, on the results, right? So whatever model you, you pick, if it's physics-based, you know which deviation you are having, and then you can play with that one upwards or downwards, right? So in our case, we, we pick, um, there is one model for NREL, is National Lab from USA, and we pick that one. You can pick any other model, a like single diode model, for example, as well, and then optimize the parameters of that certain model as well. Okay, I see, and I have a second question. You said that you were using these models to do predictive maintenance. Mm -hmm. But you also have to take into account that the parameters will vary over time, right. I assume, because of just aging. Right. So you have to retrain it, but how do you make sure you're not retraining with data that would have prob like there could be problems? You need to make sure that you're not retraining on data that has anomalies. Right, how, right. Do you have a method for that? Well, obviously, uh, we have a cleaning part before using the data to, to do the digital twinning. Uh, we have also some filterings. We know that um, the PV system performs at best when they are close to clear sky conditions. So we have a clear sky model that actually filters the moments that you have clear sky conditions and you know that you are not actually getting data from um, shading, for example, or from soiling, or uh, yeah, any other, other thing that, you, that can actually uh, decrease the power. So we just select those 
those moments. Okay, and thanks. Yeah. There was a question back there. It's always the same, is it? <laughs> thanks for the talk, great presentation. Uh, quick question, Do, why, why are you using genetic algorithms and did you try gradient-based method? Like, is it possible in, in this? Well, scenario. we are using this, this algorithm because it uh, was fast enough for us. That's the first thing. Um, we, we have, by the nature of, of the problem, we have a lot of local minima. So uh, we tried with another, another methods, and this was the one that went actually out of the local minima. Uh, obviously, it's not deterministic method, which means that it's not offering you uh, the actual value right that you are looking for, but it's really close. We achieve uh, with satellite-based data 94%, 95% accuracy, and then with measured data, obviously that accuracy increased and went up like 97%, more or less. Right. Uh, and then we can assume also that one or two percent are because the model is not deterministic, right? Yeah, but um, other methods, we, we try other methods, we compare with other methods, and this is the one that worked for us the fastest. That's why right. we pick it. Great, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Further questions? Yeah. Um, sorry, I think Sharon was quicker after the object, sorry. Um, I was wondering why you included uh, like the, the tilt and azimuth angle as parameters. They are not values that are fixed and that you know in advance? Um, yeah, you, that, that's basically the, the question, right? The main question is like, what happens if you don't have the characteristics from the design? and Tilt and azimuth angle obviously comes from the design. Um, right now, what, it, what happens a lot in, in Europe, uh, mostly in, in Germany and in Spain, where you have a lot of PV plants that are really, really old, and they, they went from one owner to another owner, is that they don't have actual, the, the, the whole design of the plant, right? So we have to look for that, and we have to figure out the way to get those characteristics. And tilt and azimuth angle, they are obviously one of the main, the main um, parameters for a PV plant, because basically tells you how the plant is facing the sun, right? So it's, it's really important, that's why we pick those ones as well. Uh, that's one of the case. A different case is also for the rooftops. So normally people just install um, in their houses and they don't know the inclination and the actual orientation of the, of the house because you cannot change that, right? So you just have to install it and that's it. You just deal with it. Um, some of them, they didn't even know what's the inclination of the roof, so we can actually get it with this, with this um, optimization. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I can add uh, that even in Switzerland, we have the same problem. Mm. And as a network operator, we have the problem that we have a, a element in our system that says here there is a PV mm. with this power in this address. And we have the measurement, but we don't know anything about uh, the tilt or the azimuth. Right, right. And my question would be, how does perform your model in case that uh, the measurement include different orientations and inclinations of uh, rooftops in that case? Because we have just one measurement, mm -hmm. but the models are located in different rooftops, different surfaces. Okay. So in, in that case, depends what's your, um, what is your, your data coming from, right? So if the, if the data is coming from, the, from each individual rooftop, then you can actually apply the same algorithm for one individual rooftop, right? But then if you have everything aggregated, uh, then obviously the, the thing that you're going to have from the um, algorithm is going to have a, is going to be a twin that actually uh, averages out all the installations that are aggregated in the same line, right? We had we have a couple of um, cases like that, and obviously works better in summer, for example, because in winter if it's satellite based you have more deviations in irradiance, um, and those things. I mean when you have with different tilt angles and different uh, orientations, then it's sensitive uh, to the shape of the curve, right? Because uh, let's remember that the, the solar power follows like a bell. Um, and then if you have different orientations, different tilts, then that bell is gonna change shape, right? So, yeah, but basically you get an aggregated or an average of everything you have there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And maybe a second question. Do mm -hmm. you believe that your uh, model or your genetic algorithm could work 
if you would uh, provide the potential rooftops, the potential surfaces, and uh, kind of the goal would be to define how many power is located in which surface? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I mean, the, the only difference I think is, is it's gonna be faster, it's gonna be slower, right? Because if you if you start from a point that you are very close to the actual values, then your your whole optimization is gonna take like few time, right? But then if you're gonna start like let's say you start from one kilowatt peak of install capacity and then your install capacity is actually one gigabyte, so then one giga is is complicated to uh, to make it faster, right? But then if you start act from close to the actual parameters, it's gonna be faster for sure. But it's going to work. I mean, it's either it takes longer or shorter, but it's going to work for sure. Yeah. 